morning. Uh, Dr. Deutsch, unfortunately, is not going to be uh, here today, so I'm going to start with the first uh, uh, talk. Uh, it is interesting because there's such a multidisciplinary group of people coming from different backgrounds. What I do is called most frequently interventional procedure, interventional radiology, interventional neuroradiology, endovascular uh, procedures. And they now happen all over the body. Uh, interesting enough, the brain actually was the first place where this started. Uh, the ability to enter the vascular system uh, through either the femoral, umbilical, uh, or brachial, radial approach and reach different parts of the body. What I will try to concentrate is how these new technologies have reached tremendous advances in a very difficult disease called vascular anomalies or vascular malformations. So um, this is my disclosures. Uh, it's important to understand that as we are getting better, as the type of procedures are getting more sophisticated, it is a team effort. It is impossible for one individual to do all this. So we have now a team that includes pediatric anesthesiologists, pediatric intensive care, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have also a pediatric endovascular uh, uh, team, uh, which is primarily dedicated to treating children, which many of you in this audience know are not small adults, but they have their individual problems and so on. Uh, it's imperative that if anybody is going to come into this field, a thorough knowledge of anatomy is mandatory. And it's interesting because the anatomy as it's teach in medical schools, as it's teach even during residency, is wrong because it goes from the center to the periphery. But the way that we recognize tissue is the opposite. I look at you and I recognize you by your nose, your color of your hair, your facial features, uh, you know, and then I get to know you better. Uh, the same with the vascular anatomy. There are constant parts, which are the bony foramen, as I mentioned a little bit yesterday. So I had the great honor of working with a French anatomist, Pierre Lajonniac, and we described the functional vascular anatomy of the head and neck. So I'm going to concentrate my talk for vascular malformations to the head and neck, which is the most frequent place where these conditions occur, but they can occur all over the body. They're called birthmarks. 8% of children are born with birthmarks. The most frequent birthmark, however, are the brown or the darker melanin type uh, birthmarks. However, the reds and the blue ones and purplish are usually of vascular origin. So the important is to have a good diagnosis because out of a good diagnosis will come a good treatment. And there's uh, Molacan in the Boston Children's Hospital came for the first time with a biological classification. As pediatricians, sometimes we call hemangiomas. Everything is a fruit. It's a fruit cocktail. Hemangiomas is a group of vascular lesions. But there's a significant difference depending on the biological behavior. And there's the hemangiomas, which are tumors. And there is a, a disease that proliferates. The most frequent time, there's nothing at birth, a very small mark. Within the first months of, man, of, of life, there will be a uh, reddish discoloration, a soft tissue mass that will proliferate, will grow in disproportion with the growth of the child. It will reach a maximum in that proliferative phase uh, around six months to two, three years, and then they will involute. Whereas the malformations in reality are errors of morphogenesis. There are arteriovenous shunts or short, short, sorry, short circuits. Uh, there are vascular anomalies of different types. We'll go over those. So it's imperative that as pediatricians, you know the difference between a hemangioma and a vascular malformation. The hemangiomas, which is a proliferative disease, may be of different types. They're called capillaries, cavernous, what's called the rich, rapid involuting congenital hemangiomas, the niche, non-involuting congenital hemangiomas, and then there's a very strong disease, which is a consumption coagulopathy called hemangioendotheliomas, which produce the Castleback Merritt syndrome, which is a depletion of platelets that could be, if not properly treated, could be f fatal. The hemangiomas in 30%, as I mentioned, they are present at birth, but in 70%, there's nothing there in one form or another, a macular patch, a fully grown hemangioma. Then they will proliferate. They will grow in disproportion with the growth of the child and then slowly involute. 
there's a female three to one ratio to males. The malformations, which is a morphogenic problem, they are present since birth. So they may not be recognized, but they are present at birth. They will grow commensurably with the growth of the individual. There is no female to male differentiation. They may then expand, they don't grow, they don't proliferate, they don't reproduce cells, but they may become larger because of a stimulating factor. And that could be trauma, could be hormonal changes during pu puberty, during pregnancy, and then they become arteriovenous fistulizations that become significantly more uh, obvious or prominent, symptomatic. <clears throat> There's also a significant difference in the cellular feature. In the hemangiomas, there is endothelial proliferation, so it's a disease of the endothelium. Some people believe it may be actually metastasis of the placenta. There's a lot of theories of where hemangiomas come. They have a significant number of mast cells, uh, and if they put in tissue culture, they will grow and, and, and produce, uh, uh, you know, proliferate, just as they do in the body. And they will, uh, in comparison with the malformations, which have a normal endothelial cycle, which have normal mast cell count, uh, which have full growth in tissue culture. Uh, and this is the, uh, Dr. Weiner, you know, my partner, the uh, plastic surgeon, uh, has come up with this classification that they follow the neural crest and they follow the distribution of the fifth nerve. So this is the most frequent locations where hemangiomas occur. Vascular malformation, on the other hand, uh, also follow the neural crest, but they have a relationship between the brain, the mandible, and the spinal cord. I won't bother you too much. There will be questions at the end, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, the, the main question when, when faced as a physician with this kind of problems is to understand what is the problem. Patient problem can be cosmetic deformities, could be hemorrhage, which can be quite severe. They can have functional problems such as airways, such as uh, feeding, speech, vision, etc. And they not frequently when they come to us, they have had multiple surgical interventions. Many times they aggravate the condition. Congenital vascular anomalies uh, are a non-hereditary entity. So you may come, a child, a mother will come with you, my child has this vascular malformation. First, you assure them it's not their fault. And there's very, very few congenital types, which I will show you. But the majority are uh, spontaneous uh, manifestations. So in March 1990, we published a paper for 3,000 consecutive patients with vascular lesions, both hemangiomas and vascular malformations, eight monozygotic twins. One child had it and one, the other one did not. So though not, it's not a fully <coughs> proven thing by, by geneticists, it's a good thing that it's not a familiar, it's not a, a, a hereditary. And here's two little girls. One has a hemangioma in the involuting phase and one does not. So monozygotic twins with no uh, two diseases. Here is a cystic hygroma in two monozygotic twins. One has it, one does not. What is the role of endovascular intervention and radiology in the treatment of these vascular lesions? Well, in hemangiomas today, the treatment of choice is propanolol, a beta blocker. It's incredibly effective. It's very simple, very low risk. All you have is a pediatric cardiac console, make sure that kid doesn't have a cardiac anomaly, it's a very safe drug. So it's rare that we need to intervene in hemangiomas. There's obviously exception to every rule. This is a little girl in 2008 that has a very extensive uh, hemangioma extending from the parotid area all the way to the airway. So this is in February 2008. Uh, she was treated uh, with uh, corticosteroids and then propanolol and did not respond. 2009 continues to proliferate. Here's the difference between and after propanolol. Uh, you can see that actually the tumor is continued to proliferate, so it did not respond, uh, but it's rare. This is not common. Uh, this is the same child and it continued to, uh, to expand. So we felt justified to try bleomycin. Bleomycin is a uh, 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 chemotherapeutic agent, uh, which actually is quite effective in inhibiting vascular growth. Uh, there's a some experience existed already in South Africa before we did it here in the United States where injection directly into the hemangioma can be actually quite, quite uh, uh, dramatic. And this is after two direct injections into the vascularity of the hemangioma and she had 
a very significant improvement and eventually get a complete involution of the hemangioma. And this is radiographically or through MRI. This is 2008. This is after a course of steroids and propanolol. And this is after the bleomycin. You can see a nearly total disappearance of the tumor. But this is the exception, not the rule in hemangiomas. There's another group called the non-involuting congenital hemangiomas that probably are not hemangiomas. Uh, these kids uh, present with a soft tissue mass pulse at all, very similar, but radiographically and clinically like hemangiomas, but they do not involute. So this is a different type of tumor, and in this, the endovascular treatment plays a very important role. This is the same child, and this is after, after a transarterial embolization. Uh, we were able to shrink this thing down without a scar, uh, without any residual. Malformations, on the, other, on the other hand, the treatment of choice is endovascular. They're very difficult to operate unless they're dry. They're very difficult to manage. You know, there's no medical therapy for them. The main role of endovascular treatment is to do it prior to surgery to dry it up. Sometimes we have to clean what happened in surgery. That means they could not remove the whole tumor or the whole, not a tumor, sorry, the whole malformation. So we may have to intervene at that time. There's many, many, many patients that we cannot cure. So all we want to try to do is improve the quality of life. So it's a palliative treatment. And this is an example of an AV malformation that is involving the mandible. And you can see the bony remodeling from this very high flow lesion with these big venous pouches. And we've learned that many of this, the disease is primarily in the venous side. Uh, this is an angiogram of the internal maxillary artery. This is an angiogram of the facial artery. It's a very high flow. It's impossible to treat this surgically except removing the entire mandible, which is an extremely deforming uh, treatment. This is a coaxial system where we have one catheter at the origin of the main feeder called the inferior dental, and then we have a double lumen balloon catheter. So we have a balloon to stop the flow, and this is the injection of a liquid embolic, which is like a plastic, it's like Play-Doh, and you inject this material, which is in DMSO, and it lets harden, and this is the progressive injection, and our goal is to reach that vein, and here is the continuous injection with one single catheter, with one injection, we have a continuous column injection. We continue injecting towards the AV shunt. At the end, we did not get a portion, so we go percutaneously, guided by ultrasound, and puncture the lesion, and then inject additional liquid embolic agent. And this is the control angiogram after, uh, with, with very good preservation of the bone. A vascular malformation of the nose. This is more difficult because the skin is involved. Very hard to preserve the skin. So here we have a good surgical team, and the goal and the idea is that you know that the surgical team can bail out, so we go for broke and we just, doesn't matter if we get some necrosis, it's done on purpose. So here we dry it up, endovascular with crazy glue, NBCA, and this is the same child after a surgical resection and a skin graft with a laser uh, thing. It's obviously not perfect, but it's a big improvement. Here's another young man. This is a photo when the had this little birthmark in the upper lip that you see here. This is the same young man when he came to see us uh, at the time that he came. He had ligations all over, and he had this angiogenesis. They grow because there is a proliferation of vessels due to the AV fistula. It's just sucking blood. And this is the same angiogram where you, there's no access to it from the femoral axis, so we go directly puncture, do a very aggressive embolization, close AV fistulas. This is a technique that we developed with, uh, with Milton is that I would dry a portion and my surgeon would take one portion. In the old times, AVMs, you either get them all or they go into a bloody mess. So what we do is we actually piecemeal them. And this is the same gentleman. We've removed the upper part. And this is after I have done multiple injections and take this zone. So we're going to remove this zone and close it, let it heal. So we've gone from this to this to this to this. Now, what's fascinating to me is look at the angiogenesis here. We never touched this area. We never touched this area. But by getting rid of the nidos in this area, all this, oops, all this has regressed. So you can see regression of vascular proliferation uh, when you get rid of them. So this is before 
you know, and this is how he got so this is the same young man. You change the life of these people with this type of operations. Another woman, now she's got an ischemic ulcerations due to the AVM, the venous hypertension, and the proximal ligations, and this is how she looks after a combined treatment. Venous malformation is a different type of disease. Venous malformations, uh, are, are, I'll show you some examples, and lymphatics are treated by a technique called sclerotherapy. Sclerotherapy is the injection of something to destroy the endothelium and permit scarring of the uh, malformation. This is a, a cartoon. This is a normal vein. A normal vein has the endothelium here, has a single layer of uh, smooth muscle uh, cells, and has innervation. In venous malformation, there is a malformation in the wall where the endothelium does not, the endothelium and the muscle cell talk to each other. So the endothelium will make the muscle layer proliferate. If you take an angioplasty, for example, in the coronaries, they strip off the endothelium, the muscle will overgrow and will create a intima, intima hyperplasia. Here there is a lack of muscle, there's a lack of innervation, and therefore the venous malformation will engorge with Valsalva. You have a patient with a bluish discoloration, the skin is abnormal temperature, the, the uh, lesion can expand by bending over or pushing, and that's very typical of venous malformation. So you see this, this bluish discoloration, they, it's soft, compressible, you press them, they empty, and then three, four, five seconds later it fills up. You ask the patient to bend over, and you see them really swell up. Those are venous malformations. So just clinically, you can differentiate them. <coughs> Excuse me. Venous malformation, when I started treating them almost 30 years ago, we started with ethanol, pure alcohol. It's very effective, but it's very aggressive. It can produce this kind of ulcerations. You know, eventually they heal and can give very good results. Today we no longer use alcohol. We use more uh, 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 pleomycin. I'll show you that. Now, we do neurophysiologic monitoring, a facial nerve monitoring. Uh, I work with a very good uh, a neurophysiologist that started this many years ago, and they come in and they uh, trace the facial nerve. So they trace and they actually paint the course of the facial nerve. And obviously, that's very important for uh, not puncturing the facial nerve, uh, but also for the surgery. And then this is the, uh, the same little girl. She's got multifocal. By the way, venous malformation and lymphatic are much more frequently multifocal than AVMs. Arterial venous malformations are usually in one place, although they can be multiple. And here we do a combination. We do sclerotherapy to dry it up for surgical removal in certain parts, but certain other parts cannot be treated by surgery, so we combine with bleomycin. This is the surgery in a venous malformation that is properly dry. comes out almost like a hemorrhoid. It's, you know, it's fully thrombosed, so it permits the surgeon to see the facial nerve, permits the surgeon to see uh, clear margins and take this thing out. The same kit after we did a series of surgery and sclerotherapies. Now she's not cured, and she will have some, you can see there's still some venous prominent channels, but this is not a malignant disease, so we don't want to disfigure the child trying to cure every cell. So this is where we started. This is where we are with this girl. We also intervene early. This is a patient with uh, a venous malformation, which is deforming the very soft matter bone. So we treat early to permit return of that. This is the injections. And this is the same patient before. And this is, so I apologize, not a bony window. But once you get rid of the venous malformation, there is remodeling of the bony structures. So we want to intervene early to prevent deformities such, such as uh, a prognatism, uh, such as malar deformities. So we do intervene very early. This same child that you know can see looks normal with normal thing. Bleomycin has changed everything. The problem with bleomycin is it can produce pulmonary fibrosis. So we limit the dose to no more than 15 milligrams per session and no more than 400 milligrams for the life of the individual. The advantages is minimal inflammation response, ideal for mucosal or orbital lesions. The problem is dose limiting for what I mentioned, the, the, the risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And when there is high flow lesions, you gotta slow the flow or you know, the, the bleomycin will wash out and it will not produce this desired thing. It's also important that skin pigmentation is not something that can happen. If they scratch, the pleomycin will go right where the hyperemia is <coughs> and produce some discoloration. I'll show you some examples. This is how we mix the pleomycin. 
This is the cookbook, but it's, it's a work in progress because we're learning in certain lesions. We may make a foam. The foam permits thrombosis, and the foam permits stagnation of flow. This is an example of a mucosa lesion, buccal mucosa, one injection of bleomycin, and this is the result. So very, very powerful. Here's a tongue, full thickness of the tongue before. Here's a, the tongue after two treatments of uh, sclerotherapy bleomycin. Here is the mucosa of the lower eyelid before treatment. This is the same patient after. No surgery, no lasers, just the bleomycin injections. And here's a, child, a young man that has the upper eyelid, lower eyelid, and conjunctiva, and this is the same. I wanted to go for more, but he was very happy with the, the results. So got a girlfriend, everything went by. No, I'm just kidding, I don't know. <laughs> this is a little more difficult uh, problem because the conjunctiva is involved. So you have the upper eyelid, the lower eyelid, and you have the conjunctiva. And this is the injection of the foam. You can see through one injection, we can get all the way down to this part. And this is the same lady. She sent me this picture. She doesn't want to come off. It's not a good picture. But I'll show you another example of a conjunctival. This used to be a real big surgical problem using embryonal, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> amniotic fluid membrane to make a, uh, a graft. So we do, this is after the first treatment, this is after the second treatment. So this is where we started. It was all stuck to the cornea. The cornea is preserved uh, and everything. Here's another one with a sinus pericranium. It's connected to the brain in the middle. This is after many laser treatments. Uh, this is the injection of contrast to see the venous drainage. This is the same child with progressive treatments and this is where uh, we, we stop the treatment with this. He still has had some recurrence in the upper eyelid the tough the issue is to really get rid of it. This is the kind of discoloration that can happen with tape. We learned the hard way with bleomycin. So, you know, this is important. This is from the endotracheal tube. Uh, take nine months to go away. This is a little girl who scratched herself after bleomycin. So it's important that we prevent scratching. It's important that uh, the tape is removed. So we have developed techniques to immobilize the endotracheal tube to prevent the use of tape. We had one uh, child that the airway was not protected and, you know, they excavated in the middle of the night and it's the only bad problem we've had uh, with the treatment in over 500 cases. Lymphatic malformation is a, the last group of lesions I will show you. Uh, we have now over 300, 350. They can be macrocystic, microcystic or mixed. Very clinically, they're not bluish, they're not reddish, they can be normal skin, uh, but they, if you trans illuminate, if they have clear fluid, they will show this transillumination. So even in very rural areas, you can make the diagnosis just by simple. Or you put a needle in the fluid that comes out. It's very typical. Uh, but this is very simple. They can have all different type of fluids, of lymphatic fluid that can be drained. Uh, you know, the, some of it can be bloody. Some of it can be more milky. Depends on uh, the, the type. The two main treatments is doxycycline, an antibiotic, which is very, very good. It used to be for pleural effusions but it's very good for this application, and bleomycin or a combination of both. It's key to drain these lesions. So here is a very extensive lesion that we have a lot of drainage, draining that. This is the child before any treatment. This is the child, this is the, some of the fluid that was removed. And this is the child, I think, after the third or fourth treatment. Sorry. Uh, I have actually a better one. I have to update the slide. This is another child. This is too big for one shot of sclerotherapy. So surgically, we removed this huge mass. This is when she came to me, a little girl from Algeria. Uh, you can see that it's got the whole chest wall, axilla, the occiput is involved, very extensive. Uh, this is progressive treatments, and this is you know, where we are in 2013, and I just saw her uh, last week. She looks very, very well. All this is scars from the chest tube that she had to, to, to have, Robbie, you know, for, and so on. But no surgery. This is all done with sclerotherapy. Another macrocystic lymphatic malformation I showed you yesterday. This is the same child after sclerotherapy. And this is a girl that's got it in the region of the facial nerve uh, before and after. No surgery, only sclerotherapy. Another one that had an acute bleed into it. You see the fluid fluid level uh, in the MR. This is the same patient before and after sclerotherapy treatment. So it's very reproducible and it helps. This is the MR shows. This is not completely cured. But again, this is, not, uh, this is not cancer, so we don't have to go for growth. This is what we started. This is where we were. <coughs> Excuse me. Retroauricular. This used to be a big problem because the 
parotid gland is here in the facial nerve. Uh, this is the same girl long term. Uh, you can see the outcome of this. Uh, this is what we started. This is where she is. Okay, uh, this is just different areas of the body uh, that we can see. And this is the MR that shows macrocystic before, and this is after the uh, treat before the last treatment. Involving the tongue is the most difficult to treat because the tongue you need the lip to lip contact. The tongue has to hit the maxilla for normal growth. So when they're sticking the tongue like that, it's very hard to get a normal bite and a normal growth. So this is little Jake that we did some the floor of the mouth. Uh, then she started having problems with bleeding from this uh, typical lymphatic malformation of the tongue. Have these white, reddish uh, little uh, uh, lesions in the tongue floor of the mouth, and that can become. This is after treatment, but it can be problematic and bleed a lot. This is after the bleomycin injection directly into the lesion gets black and green. And the first one I show you, I got so scared, but nothing happened. So this is the same kid. This is how the improvement, it look, almost looks normal, and he has almost a normal bite. And this is now, you know, he's an older kid, and he has had tremendous, tremendous improvement. Orbit, very difficult to treat surgically. This is an injection directly into the orbit. Same kid. This is the kid after. Unfortunately, by the time he came to me, he had low vision of the right eye because of the compression of the optic nerve. So we need to get them early. Uh, the earlier we get them, the better results we'll get. Uh, and then this girl has a lymphatic malformation and became like that, so it was something different. So she developed a dural fistula. That means an AV fistula inside a lymphatic malformation. We treat the AVM by crazy glue injection and she get this improvement. Uh, lymphatic malformation of the cornea, very difficult again. This is after uh, treatment. Another lymphatic malformation of the cornea, and this is how he looks. Chest sclerotherapy, no surgery. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing the time. This is uh, uh, another technique that we developed, which is with, uh, with image guided. We can actually do a 3D, superimpose the MR on a CT scan, and then uh, this lesion, for example, is in the lead region of the, of the optic nerve, so we can actually target that lesion and then uh, the machine helps us to guide the needle. And here's how the needle is being guided. So if we're going a little low, we have to correct the track. This is the target, and they correct the track, and you hit the lesion. There's right in target. This is the injection of the chemotherapeutic agent. And I don't know if I'm boring you with all this. I think it's a little too much. This is another technique called gravity to get lymphocytic, very microcystic lesions. And we go through and through the lesion and then use a column of, of water. And as we move backwards, once it enters a channel, the liquid goes down. And this is, you can catheterize a one micro, micro cyst. And through that, we can get all the way to the tongue. So this is the injection of uh, really opaque material. This is the same chart as the first one we did. And you can see the tongue. I got so worried. But as I said, eventually this got really good. So we started from this and end with that. Lymphatic malformation, again, of the tongue before and after treatment. The mother came complaining that we missed one. <laughs> I was so happy with the result. Mother wanted, so I didn't do it again. So I don't. Then this is another mm -hmm. kid that came with that, you know, with uh, post-surgical with facial nerve damage. And this is how we progressively improve it, just with this gravity technique. And this is how she looks now. This is before, this is after. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope I gave you a little idea of what we do. Any questions, then? Yes, yes, yeah. We're not shy to start early, actually. But, you know, um, in our team, we have a... Uh, yes. Well, not only that, but then you get fatty fibrous tissue and more scar, then you're going to need some plastic surgery to improve that. That's absolute. You know, we have in our team uh, the, a medical person, which is a pediatric hematologist, Francine Blythe. And I think that as you, as you work in... Vascular malformation is not a common disease. So it's important to make a good team. But we start, you're absolutely right, we start as soon as the diagnosis is made. You can do some topical. If it doesn't work, you go to PO. It's a very benign medication. Yeah, okay.